Hello and thank you for watching this video here from us at Sustainable Aylesbury. Uh, today we're here to talk about sustainability as we are every time but today uh, around your home, in and around your home and uh, looking at particularly the concept of a super home. Um, so the title of today's session is Everyday Sustainability at Home and Creating a Super Home. Um, so it's without further ado uh, that I will introduce my guest for today. So Colin, hello, uh, good to have you here with me today. Morning. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. No problem at all. So just to really quickly introduce myself, I'm Bruce uh, from Sustainable Aylesbury. Uh, I guess um, it would be really good to hear a bit more about yourself, Colin. Who are you and uh, uh, why am I talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? Who am I indeed? Um, my name is Colin White. Uh, I, uh, for about 30 odd years, uh, worked in both local government and uh, at Oxford Brooks University. Uh, I was a town planner uh, by training uh, and a lecturer in the last five years of, of my career. Mm. All of what I did um, had an environmental basis. Uh, uh, my first degree was in geography and environmental studies way back in the 1980s in Manchester. Mm. Uh, and that set me on the path to environmental uh, awareness and sustainability generally. And pretty much everything I've done ever since, I've tried to fit within that particular role. Mm. Uh, and as we'll talk about later on, um, a lot of the things that we've been doing at home have, have emanated, in essence, from my um, my education. And so that's that's where I've come from. Makes sense. Uh, I'm now retired, um, and uh, earlier this week I received the first of my very small pensions, uh, which is rather nice. <laughs> that's always good to have, to have a bit more time for yourself. That's great, and it yeah. sets up really nicely. You know why why we're talking to you, um, which is obviously to do with sustainability at home. So I guess um, before we dig into sort of specifics, when when we talk about sustainability at home, what what sort of are we talking about sort of here? Uh, I think what we always need to consider is everything that we do hmm. whether that's uh, and it's almost within the house it's from the chimney pot on the top to the foundations underneath hmm. everything in between you need to consider in a sustainable way but also in the way that you use what you have um, hmm. and this is for super home purposes you you use the house in the way that you use it if you can do it in, in a more environmentally sustainable and environmentally friendly way then you're collectively you're going to be moving in the right sorts of direction so i think it's every aspect of life and living um, mm. whether that's workshop eat play whatever it happens to be and, and it then goes beyond the home of yeah i completely agree with that as a sort of general approach to life you know it's uh, they kind of come hand in hand almost and that you wouldn't be looking at making your home a more sustainable place to be if it weren't sort of ingrained into your ethos but it goes beyond say saving money or whatever it's not it's not not about that at all if that's a side benefit great but that's not the intention um, and it is and it is frequently a big side benefit actually. yes because if you're using less power you're paying less for the power right. that you use absolutely so, yeah everybody wins essentially indeed mm -hmm. so uh, a nice point then to ask so we've, we've talked about super homes what are super homes what is a super home a, a super home uh, in essence is a it's a standard house um, that's been retrofitted so stuff has been added to it uh, after its normal construction uh, with uh, usually energy saving in mind yeah uh, and uh, you then had we had somebody come around to professionally assess ours um, there they were a super homes assessor they worked out through um, the construction, the things that we've done, the way that we use the house, the fittings that we've got, and all that kind of stuff. Um, they worked out that uh, we've got a 69% a saving mm -hmm. on CO2 emissions uh, on average. That's really Super cool. home has to have at least 60% savings on CO2. Yeah. So you would introduce the energy saving measures that ultimately re reduce your energy use and therefore your CO2 emissions. And we save nearly 70%. Now that was done quite a number of years ago. In the meantime, we've had various things added to it, which mm. may well hopefully increase our savings even more. Which is really good. I think one key thing to say here is um, the measure the measure that we're talking about is saving CO2. It's not saving money. It's not anything else. It's, 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 it's saving in CO2, which is a really important Absolutely. point. Uh, another thing to say is, um, so Sue Homes are an organization, right? Yeah, they are. Set up under the National Energy Foundation a number of years ago. Mm. They, they kind of went into a, a sort of stasis a few years ago um, because 
there weren't enough people engaged with the process. There are quite a number of super homes throughout the land, mm. um, but there aren't enough uh, in terms of a, a decent spread. There, there's one in Aylesbury, that's us. Mm. Um, mm. There's a couple nearby, um, but there's only one in Aylesbury. Aylesbury is a town of 70 odd thousand people, mm. probably about 30,000 houses. Why is there only one super home? There are more out there that will no doubt qualify, but there's a lack of engagement in the process. Yeah. So it's it's being looked at at the moment, hopefully being relaunched later in the year, um, and hopefully there'll be a greater engagement. One of the issues, of course, is that uh, when we're doing our super homes days, we're, t- we're preaching to the converted, and the vast majority mm. come along, yeah, they're people like you and I who go and find out a little bit more about a certain element. We've done a lot ourselves, we then go and want to do a little bit more. Mm. So it, it's kind of it's kind of closed at the moment, but we'll be opening up again later this year. And that's presumably sort of COVID related, COVID related reasons. Uh, it partly COVID related because, of course, you can't have a, an open day and seek to do that. So you could to seek to do it socially distanced, but it would be a real problem. You know, when four people yeah. are sticking their head up through the loft to look at the, the insulation you've got all at the same time. You can't socially distance unless you've got a massive lock open. Um, so you can't part COVID related part because there, there was a lack of interest in the, the process and, and what was going on. With it. Mm, mm. I, I think, yeah, that's one thing that I think sustainability as a general topic has is certainly a problem we have sustainable Aylesbury as well. You know, the sorts of people who, who will be watching this will be already interested in sustainability in Aylesbury. How do you reach those people that are, you know, not sustainability isn't a sort of thing that matters um, so I, I, I see that as a problem. It's a problem for uh, lots of organisations involved in sustainability. It is, um, definitely. So how are you how are you involved in super homes? You've kind of sort of touched on this already, but yeah, I did. Yeah, the, the open days that, that we hold September time, you normally do it over two or three days. They often uh, occur along with the uh, this is historic buildings open days. So you're mm-hmm. trying to you're trying to trap people with a, an event over a weekend. Um, I've had um, four separate years when I've opened up in September. We had uh, probably over those four years, something like 70 or 80 people come along. Like I said, the vast majority are already converted to the message. That yeah. You don't need to tell them an awful lot. And it's the sort of side conversations that we have. I remember talking to one person about um, red mason beans. Um, we happened to have what we had. They all died, unfortunately, last year. Mm. Cold. Uh, we had red mason beans. Um, for pollination purposes in the garden and at our allotment. Mm. Um, so you know, it, it was a side conversation and, and this chap said, that's a good idea, I think I'll do that myself. That's what you get, people going away with just a little nugget. They've already got the solar panels or whatever it happens to be. Mm. They're just mm. expanding their, um, their, their sort of set of measures that they've got. So open days, people come along, they get ideas, they take those away. Hmm. Sounds good. Sounds like a really sensible idea. Um, and, you know, uh, sort of, what's the word? Uh, relevant to me personally, as you can see, I live in a, in a very old, crazy old house. Uh, we're grade two listed. It was built in 1806 and it's terrible from the uh, perspective of sustainability and environment. We have single glazed sash windows, currently looking at one now. Um, we have no cavity in the wall to insulate, so we can't do things like cavity wall insulation. Uh, we have a 21-year-old gas boiler, a relic, um, but I'm interested in these sorts of, of, of things. Um, so, uh, you know, and being grade two listed, anything we do, we have to go through planning permission. Um, so I'm really interested to see, you know, what sorts of things you guys have done uh, to know where I could personally, in my journey on this area, uh, you know, learn from. So that's a good place to ask. So what sorts of things have you guys had done? I, I'm going to have to look at my piece of paper in front of me because okay. there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> good problem to have. It is actually, yeah. And we save money, but that's, as, as we already touched on, that's not the point. Uh, so we have uh, solar photovoltaics, solar hot water, mm-hmm. um, all on the roof, of course. Um, as we come down, we've got sheets wool insulation in the loft. Uh, I did that myself. That actually cost quite a lot. Mm. Um, and I had to go to the chiropractor three times because I hurt my back doing it. We've got a very shallow pitch on our roof and I had to lie in the loft and sort of move this stuff along. Mm. And I twisted my back. Um, so it was a very expensive installation. But that was, that's, I got a week back, unfortunately. Side effects. Uh, yeah. It was, yes. It was, a, it, was a, it was collateral damage, I suppose, is the only way to look at it. Um, so sheets will insulate in the loft. Uh, we've got three sun pipes. Um, we had a, a new boiler and um, hot water cylinder fitting as part of the solar hot water. They, they kind of went together. Mm. Um, cavity wall insulation was done. Uh, we've replaced a number of windows when we needed to. 
Uh, we've got low energy appliances, fridge, freezer, washing machine, things like that. Um, we've got LED lighting in our kitchen. We have 13 halogen bulbs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, hideously expensive to run if you put all, we, we, they're on two circuits, thankfully. So we, did, we didn't have to have them all on at the same time, but replaced all of those with LED lights, uses less than a, a fifth of the energy um, to light them now. Um, we've got uh, low energy light bulbs throughout the rest of the house. I'm replacing those with LED lights, which are even less um, energy intensive, which is good. I've got my electric bike and we've more recently got an electric car. Mm. There are countless other things that we do, but those are the main sorts of measures that we've, uh, we've introduced. Mm. There's so much there. Uh, yeah. I, I wanna, I'm really tempted to dive down and ask specifics on some of these items, but I'm going to start by asking, so when, when did these um you know you start implementing some of these measures or was it kind of a gradual as things made sense kind of process how did that come to be it, we, we started we, we moved here in uh october 2001 yeah uh, it started on in essence on day one we yeah. basically replaced all the light bulbs with low energy light bulbs mm. throughout the house wherever we could uh, and it's it started then and it continues today and um, so over the last 20 odd years that's what we've done the vast majority of the work was done in 2004. That's when we had our extension built. Right. Um, we, we, we had a very small kitchen that had a door on either side, like a square sort of Z shape, a door on either side, a window, and it was useless in terms of space, absolutely yeah. useless. And one of the first things we, we did when we moved in was think about um, extending the back of the house. Uh, and we did that. We, we basically created out of our corridor, we created a kitchen dining room. Um, and it, it all kind of stemmed from that. We're having a lot of work done on that. It's extended at the back of the house behind the dining room as well. We had the sun pipes put in. We decided we'd go for solar photovoltaics and put water on the roof. The, our boiler, even then, was already over 20 years old. Mm. Um, and somebody came around and looked at it and said, no, we don't like the look of that. Um, so it kind of wrapped up in, in that. We had to have a new hot water cylinder to go with the boiler, to go with the solar hot water. So 2004, huge amount of work mm. done at that particular point in time. Uh, and uh, in July, my second son was born as well. So it's kind of all these momentous things that are going on all at the same time. Right. My advice would always be, if you're doing this kind of stuff, if you can kind of concentrate into a, a short period of time, that pain is over very quickly. Yeah. And then the gain you get, we've had the gain from that for the last 17 years, um, mm. in essence. So 2004 was when we had most of it done. Mm. Um, 2012, I got, I think it was about 2012, I got my bike. Um, 2018, we got the car. And in 2020, um, we had to have a new solar hot water panel fitted on roof because we had a leak uh, in the roof. Um, and the previous two panels had to be replaced with a single panel. Yeah. Um, so and that was an expense I wasn't. I wasn't kind of budgeting for it, but it had to be done. I go into the necessary evil. Uh, old house, used yeah. to them. Plenty of unnecessary yeah. <laughs> evil expenses, things rotting that you weren't expecting to rot looking at my windows at this point. <laughs> well, it, it, see, that, that's, the, that's the issue there. If, if something is broken, mm. it, it can't ultimately be fixed, then replacing is one of the things that you need to do in any yes. house. Yeah. You know, our life. roof is broken. So we had to replace part of the rig. Again, it was the tire that sort of broke. So we had to do something. So yes, it's life. It's what you get. It is indeed. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, you, what your approach is to housing. Things go wrong. So um, that's really awesome. That's a really good piece of background. And um, I think what I really like to do is uh, dig into the specifics now. Yeah. Um, so uh, where to start? Let's start with the sun pipe, um, if, if that's okay. So. Um, just because it's one of the more sort of novel, the no, more sort of novel items on the list. Um, what is a sun pipe? Let's start with that. For anyone that is, is going, huh, I haven't heard of that one. And, and interestingly enough, when we have the super homes open days, that is the thing that people often focus on. But yeah, we've all done so much stuff. And panels and things like that. It's kind of boring and old hat. Uh, well, actually, sun pipes are even more old hat than, than the solar PV and hot water. Sun pipes have been around since Aztec. Mm. Um, they basically constructed their mud huts and they created a tube um, pointing in the right direction which allowed light into their uh, the internal parts of their buildings it's picked up on that as a principle and what we have we've got three of them they're, they're in essence they're a, they're a metal tube um, that's got um, elbow junctions so you can sort of twist it and turn it and mm. you can create zeds and whatever it happens to be the inside of these is highly reflective um, if you were looking directly at the sun you'd be blinded almost instantly 
yeah. from it. So it brings the light in from the roof. So you have a dome on the roof that captures the light, channels it down this pipe, um, and that then it goes through a prismatic um, cover on the ceiling in any room, and that spreads the light out. Mm. So you get it, it sort of throws it off in all sorts of different um, directions uh, through the, the, the internal refraction within the, um, the prism. Uh, and they are they are an absolute revelation. They're not particularly mm -hmm. expensive. They were, they, when we had them built, uh, put in, they were a couple of hundred pounds each. Really? Now, whether or not we get the energy savings from not having the lights on, um, I, I don't know. We might get that, but I'm, I've never done any of these things for cost savings mm -hmm. or how much it's going to save. It's about planetary issues. Mm -hmm. We don't need the lights on when you've got the sun pipes in. And the one over our stairs is an absolute revelation. It really mm -hmm. is. It was a really dark, sort of dingy place, and potentially quite dangerous unless you switch the light on on the landing yeah. to come down the stairs. And this this thing lights the, the hall and the stairs brilliantly. Mm. Um, and they're That's that really good, cool. they're that efficient that um, they will drag in moonlight. Mm. Mm. Um, That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it is. It's, it's fantastic. So you actually get uh, I can't remember what the band was. They talk about moonlight shadows, mm. um, and you, that's what you can you can even get moonlight shadows through a sun pump. So mm. it's a light pump, in essence. Mm -hmm. um, they're, 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 not, they're not that intrusive either. Though. They're, they're about 30 centimetres across. You can get really big ones mm. uh, to, to um, light a big area. Uh, and they generally stick out above the roof by about a foot, maybe 30 centimetres, mm. something mm. like that. Um, not, not particularly intrusive at all. Uh, they came, ours was fitted by a builder. Um, we had to cut, cut some of the tiles on the roof, thread it through the, the felt and, and cut the holes in the ceiling. Um, I guess anybody could fit those if they felt um, particularly uh, competent. I, I'm not very good on roofs. Yeah, I'm the same. <laughs> Heights are my one fear. When I was painting these wooden windows, it was uh, 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 more than just the, you know, the actual practical issue of painting windows. It's coming across uh, trying to deal with my fear of heights, basically. Yeah. Completely understand that. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I think so. Some pipes are certainly one of the measures um, that I, I I didn't even know existed. And like you say, I I'm I'm on this journey. Have looked into this sort of thing before. Um, so that's really really cool. I guess one of the other benefits, aside from just you know potentially energy saving, is it's it's a natural light, isn't it? Unlike you know um, a light bulb, it, it's uh, yeah. it is literally natural light. So um, you get sort of benefits in that regard too. And it's really cool. and it does work really really well because you do get that because they've got this prism. Um, cover it mm. spreads the light so you get this sort of flood of light mm. and it is much better it really is mm. Um, mm. I, and i always hope that when i had the super homes open days that the sun is shining and i can take people to the bottom of the stairs and they can mm. appreciate this this brightness that we have um, mm. but you can't turn the sun off no, um, indeed. <laughs> so, so i can't demonstrate what it was like before yes yeah so but it, they are they are really good and you've you've got a listed building the chances are you might be able to get away with that kind of thing if it's on a, a back roof or something like that. So because they're not massively intrusive, you may not need the, the sort of consents that you normally have. Mm. So that would be interesting to look into. Uh, at the moment, so well, I come on to something that's a bit more sort of, uh, in this sphere at least, more run of the mill, the likes of... Uh, you know, solar panels, basically. Yeah. Um, I know is one of the first things that people think of when they think of making a home more sustainable and generating electricity. And it's certainly the first place I went to. I would love solar panels. Um, we The problem we have in this house is that the windows, sorry, the roof that faces that way and that way uh, face out to the main road. So there's no chance we're going to get listed buildings consent to put panels on those roofs. And the other ones face away from the sun most of the time. So, uh, even if they were to grant us listed building consent, which is is a big if, um, they wouldn't generate enough energy to really be worth doing. So they wouldn't make any dent in, in any in any form. There'd be a lot of um, you know outlay. Um, yeah. I think. I think. Um, you, you you could always. This is my advice as a planner. Um, you could always test the water with the local authority and, and find out what they might think. The chances are, though, listed building. I mean, it, you're almost certainly in a conservation area because where we you are, are, we are. So you've got conservation area consent needed, listed building consent needed. The chances are you wouldn't be successful. And if you're going to put solar panels on a roof, you want them to be on the roofs that gain the sun. Absolutely. Ours, ours are almost perfectly placed. You know, they're at a um, east southeast orientation. Mm. So we get loads of sun panels. There are no trees blocking it. There are no buildings blocking it. There's no chimneys shading any part of it. 
they work efficiently throughout the day when the sun shines. Mm. That's important uh, when you're considering the solar. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. Uh, and I would say, uh, if you can, any panel, even if it's one, will make a difference. Mm, it's true. Uh, we, we've got 12 on our roof, which gives us, I don't know, something like 40 to 50% of our electricity demands mm. across the whole year. That was one of my um, questions, across the whole year. So, so how much yeah. variation is there between summer um, and winter? You bugger all if I can say that. In really? The, um, yeah. yeah. You, get, you, might get, you might get 10, 10% or something like that to 100% in the summer. Mm. Um, so from late spring to uh, late summer, we get probably about 100% of our electricity. We used to have a, a, a meter with a disc in it that, that you know, rotated clockwise when you were using energy. Yes. Um, normally they don't go clockwise, but ours did. It ran backwards <laughs> and it was a joy <laughs> That's to awesome. see it run yeah. backwards. It was brilliant. Yeah. But we contacted the, the energy company and gave them a meter reading once. They said, well, that's not possible. Uh, we've got solar panels on the roof. They generate electricity. It sends the meter back because that's not possible. Do you want me to take a video of it? It is. I've seen it. Brilliant. <laughs> it's literally uh, happening in front of me. Uh, it, it was. And, and the meter was literally going backwards because we tried to send a meter reading. There was less than the previous, the previous one. Submitted. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the energy company got wiser, and a few months later, we had a new energy. Uh, we had a new meter fitted, which only goes forwards now. Mm, it's, a, mm, it's, a, it's one of the digital meters. Right. Uh, so we, we've had generation meters and things like that fitted. They've been around for ages. Yes. It's, yeah. The meter running backwards is great. So 100% in the summer, mm. uh, probably about 10% in the winter. So about 40 to 50%. Um, throughout the year overall. Mm, that's really good to know. See what I you talked about electric car. My dream would be if I if we could get through listed buildings consent to stick panels on everything up there, you know, if you're going to do it, get get as much up there as possible. If you don't use the the energy, it's going to go back to the grid. So it's going to benefit someone in place of fossil fuel burning, which is the idea. Um yeah. but then couple the panels with something like a zappy charger um which will charge the car from only the energy from the panels that's what i'd love to get to um so it's a nice sort of hopping off point i guess into electric cars um, yes. so what did you what did you go for in the end we, we've got a renault zoe um, okay okay nice uh, february 2018 um, yeah. so it's a 67 plate but it was literally at the end of that year um it's got the 41 kilowatt battery um, I think you've got a, a leaf, haven't you? I've got an antique Nissan leaf, very first <laughs> gen, with the cream interior that's covered in small child's muddy footprints. <laughs> You'll never get those on. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It's, 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 it's a permanent feature of the car now. It is, well, it's that's character, doesn't it? it is, um, yes. so, so what's like the battery? Our battery is a 41 kilowatt battery. I guess yours is no more than 20. It was tw it's 24 total, uh, 21, I think it is usable, but yeah. it is, it's, it's 2011, so it is, you know, old. Um, yeah. So it doesn't, doesn't realistically, I get sort of 60, 50 to 60 miles of, of real range from it. Um, yeah. And, you know, because it's the first gen one, there's no such thing really as fast charging. It does have a CHAdeMO um, port on it. So, uh, you know, 50, 50 kilowatt, uh, 50 kilowatts of, of rapid charging is possible, uh, but most of the time you're limited to three with the, what they now dub the granny charger, the three pin oh. wall socket plug. But I mean, that's how we charge it. It's got such a small battery. The granny charger yeah. overnight completely fills it from empty. Indeed. So, well, we see with ours, it's a 41 kilowatt battery. So we've yeah. got twice the size of battery. If we were going to look to charge through the panels, there's, in theory, that could be done. Mm. Um, it's mm. not a particular issue. We've got a charger, it's a seven kilowatt charger on the wall just to my right and outside uh, we've got a carport uh, and the, the car sits under that now i could do that i've not charged at home since october 2019 um it's the, the charger has got a lot of cobwebs around it mm. um, the reason i don't charge at home is because i charge on the public network uh, for free um uh -huh, I, yes what's the point in paying for electricity at home when i can charge on the public network for free um i shop in certain supermarkets uh, not very often, but I do, uh, and I use their electricity network um, as much as I can. My eldest son's in Manchester University. He's not at the moment, but we, I'm taking him back, or he's going back, and I'm going to collect him shortly. Um, I can get to Manchester and back um, for, if I've got the time, for nothing, yeah. um, because I can use the charges on the, the public network. Uh, Podpoint is Podpoint. one of the better, mm -hmm. uh, one of the better networks to use, and often their charges are free. Mm. Um, I have to stop in Birmingham because you know it's about halfway there. I need a break. There's a shopping centre right next to the M6. Um, I hop off there. It's a 21 kilowatt or 20 kilowatt charger. My car can only take 
20 kilowatts as a charge. I went for the range rather than the rapid charge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was probably an error on my part, but it hasn't made a huge amount of difference. And I can get the car close to 100% uh, in about an hour uh, if I want. Mm-hmm. That was a rapid charger, I could get it quicker, but I'm getting it for free. Which is always a good thing. So I, I don't mind mentioning specifics um, here. <laughs> so uh, in Aylesbury, I'm aware of, uh, obviously, Podpoint. We uh, charge our leaf um, primarily in the garage just because of um, small children and not having the time to ferry it to and from uh, the supermarkets in question. And in Aylesbury, the supermarkets with Podpoint that are free are the Tesco's, basically. Um, yeah. In terms of other charging points I'm aware of that are free, um, if you're on the Polar Network now called BP Pulse, there is um, in Aylesbury, Asda, Asda by Stoke Mandeville, their one is free to use as well. Are there any others you're aware of that are free? No, I think you put that's Podpoint is the main network, and you can it get uh, railway stations if you're going going anywhere by train. Uh, Stoke Mandeville, Aylesbury, Hatton, uh, Parkway does uh, their Podpoint, they're free. Um, mm. As long as you get there before the Tesla, it's always there at Hatton anyway. I used to pass that when I was on the bus going to Oxford. Right, um, right. I've right, right. got to get up early to get that, that one point. So, <laughs> That's the problem uh, when it's only the one point. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. So the supermarkets are good. Tesco's are, are good. Um, Morrison's has got a genie point, so you have to pay for that. Yes, yes. Um, I've got I got a very, I've got, I've got a genie card, because when, when I first got our car, as you would have done, we probably got quite a few of the net, signed up to quite a few of the networks. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I'm not on charge uh, on the, the, um, charging BP1. side of things the bp one mm. um, because i the, whenever i tried to use the network it didn't work and um, mm. wherever i went i went down to um, sussex once and there was a, a fast charge that i could mm. use at 20 kilowatts wasn't working um, mm. that put me in a bit of a spot um, and this that was part of their network and i i had a free period for six months when i bought the car because it was new uh, and before the end of the six months, I, I said, I don't want that anymore. Uh, mm. I'm not going to pay for it because whenever I've used the network, it's failed. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I, I've not had, not had, well, how to phrase this. I have had that issue before. And then when you've got a total range of 50 miles, that really matters because your next yes. charger might be 20 miles away and you've got 10 miles of charge in the tank kind of thing. Um, but the they recently redid the app and the app now will tell you if... In, at least in most cases, if the uh, charger in question is is out of service, if the connector, specific connector on the charger is out of service, it's not always a sort of um, slam dunk, but it, it it's a, come on a long way, which is good good news. Yeah. Um, I can definitely talk to that that uh, that point. Um, yeah. you, you kind of touched but- on this already. I'm going to just really quickly mention this, then we'll move on because there's loads of other cool things to talk about, um, yeah. which is just the range of electric cars now. Yes. Um, you know, being being a first gen Nissan Leaf owner, range is always, is always a, a consideration when you're planning a long journey. Um, but I'm going to be driving into London on Monday um, for for work. Um, I'm going to be able to do that um, and charge in London and come back. That's the longest of my regular journeys. My regular commute, pre COVID and working from home, uh, was Maidenhead, and I could do that. On, on one charge and this is in the earliest form with the lowest range possible of electric car uh, maidenhead is sort of 25 miles away um, but in most towns cities uh, even some rural destinations there are charges so range while people will say oh i can't go to and from scotland uh, on a charge no you can't but neither can you as a human being so it doesn't really matter uh, yeah. so i wanted to just say that because it's a, a so- uh, our, our range on a good day is about 200 miles uh, yeah. we can get we can actually get about 220 um, mm. on a day like today where it's not too hot not too cold the sun is shining you don't need the windows of the car open you don't need the lights on you don't need the heater on it's, it's standard sort of fare uh, you, you can get i can get a good couple of hundred miles on a full charge mm. mm. so i don't I, I don't have the range anxiety for the journeys that i want to make i only get the anxiety if the charges aren't working. And I use yes. Zap as my yes. as the sort of app to, to, to find out where things are, and it, that's very good. Um, so range is, is is increasing all the time, and I think what the companies are doing, they're kind of holding back the batteries. Um, they could easily go full Tesla, you know, with a, a ninety kilowatt battery, no problems at all. But they're not doing that. They're doing the the twenty, the forty, the fifty. They might go to sixty five. You might get seventy. And then they'll go to 90 in order to sell more cars, yeah. which I think is inherently not sustainable. Indeed. Um, 
I went for, we had to replace our car. It was the best part of 20 years old. It was a, an old Renault Clio. Mm. Um, it, it had seen significantly better days. Um, everything was going wrong with it. Um, so I got rid of that. And my wife was doing a journey that needed, she needed some kind of comfort from. So and we'd always thought we would go at least hybrid, if not electric. I'm not a fan of hybrids. Mm. I, mm. I prefer full electrics. Yeah. Um, so that's what, what we did. Full electric was where we went. Um, and, and we haven't looked back. It's absolutely they're an absolute joy. It's like, like the electric bikes that exist, they're an absolute joy. And I can't understand why more people don't do it. Electric bikes, let's go there next. Um, <laughs> so uh, what, what did you go, there, go for there? I went for the, the, the Giant. Um, it's a hybrid. Uh, it looks like a woman's bike um, with me, a big fat bloke riding it. And it's quite amusing sometimes. <laughs> um, it's brilliant. Um, the range on that, in fact, the range on that is close to the range on your leaf. It's, it's mm. supposed to be about 50 miles from the battery that I've got. Uh, if, I, if I didn't weigh so much um, and didn't carry around with me so much clobber, the range would be more than about, the, I used to get about 45 or thereabouts miles out of it. Mm. I used to use it to cycle to Chinna uh, when mm. I worked with Chinna. Um, I did that two days a week. Um, that was as much as my body could take and as much as I could take in terms of time. Yes. Um, but I could get there and back twice, which is about 44 miles, usually on, on a charge. It was just mm. going into the last bar uh, on the charger. So giant hybrid is what I went for. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, the back of the range was very good was because the frame is incredibly heavy. It's mm. a really solid frame, just as well. Because I'm right, heavy. yeah, but if I was looking at, and that's one of the reasons the range is not particularly high. Yeah, so. Well, I mean, that's uh, as you say, that's still a reasonable enough range. Like, yeah. like you say, you know, uh, that's exactly what I get from my Nissan Leaf, <laughs> and yes. uh, you know, it, it, it's it's manageable. That's really yeah. cool. So, so we have um, my bike, my personal bike is 21 years old and is not electric, but it's been. The thing with bikes is um, you can fix them up really easily and add things to them. So I'm debating whether to electrify it at some point. Um, but given I've got two small children, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, um, lugging those around on my on my regular bike isn't isn't really possible. So we went for an, an, an electric cargo bike, which is brilliant. Um, so all of our local journeys, including just going to Tesco and whatever, to the shops is done in the cargo bike. Um, yeah. and I can definitely vouch for electric bikes being awesome <laughs> they are they are, they are brilliant and, and the motor gives you I'll recount hopefully not too long the story I was cycling back from China um, going along the lower Rick Way, which is kind of moderately flat really mm -hmm. uh, you run from um, it, it sort of past the edge of Princess Risborough towards um, Terry mm. uh, and uh, there's a chap in front of me all going all lycra up with his 99 speed race or whatever it happens to be uh, and I got closer and closer and closer to it as I was going along. I wasn't cycling particularly hard. The motor was helping me. I was doing 20 miles an hour, something like that. Uh, and as we came up the hill um, towards um, the goat centre, um, I was actually about five yards behind him. And he looked round and the look of shock on his face was incredible. <laughs> me, I am a big bloke. Um, I'm round, uh, basically. And it was me. I had my high vis on, but it was stretched and tight. And the look of shock on his face was hilarious. It really was. Because <laughs> I'd been 200 yards behind him, and then I was about five yards behind him going up the hill. No one just letting the battery do its work. Mm -hmm. That's what they're good for. They are brilliant for helping you on the hills. They mm. really are. I would agree. So, so what sorts of speeds do you get out of, of that bike then? Well, it, it you're like... powered up to 17 miles an hour. It's not like the sort of scooter things that you seem to be able to buy now. You just twist the grip and you can go at 25 miles an hour, no problems at all. They're a real danger. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, they're a sustainable thing to do but I, I think they've been used in the wrong way mm. um, I can't do that I have to pedal to power it and yeah. so you cannot if you take your foot off the pedals you slow down um, so I can get 17 if I can get up to 18, 19 miles an hour that's not an issue down I, mean, it's, I, I was doing 35, 40 miles an hour at, at certain points which is kind of scary <laughs> yeah it is it is <laughs> yes so, um, but they, they are brilliant um, I, I'd recommend people going for it and looking at the weight of the frame that makes a real difference mm. so that's an interesting point I, I, one I hadn't considered in, in the context of whether I bother electrifying my own bike at some point or uh, or you know get, getting a new one that's that's built for electric you know um, I hadn't considered sort of the load 
bearing capacity of the frame basically it is a 20 odd year old alloy frame of some sort um but yeah i mean obviously when you're putting batteries and motors and whatnot on it you are adding weight that's yeah. an interesting point um yeah. cool i i, I don't want to i'm going to just briefly mention scooters um i think where it would be really good to see electric scooters um you know be used is to replace those journeys you would take in a car typically and um to what i, what I think you were alluding to uh they're not currently being used in that way um they're being used as a recreational thing yeah. and um that's a shame i won't say any yeah. more on it than that in this uh in this I, I might i might be slightly less political as we get to the end <laughs> Fair enough. Understand. I, I, I only really move on because I, there's loads of other cool stuff to talk about. Yes. yes, um, yes. We've done the bikes and the cars. We've done the bikes and the cars. I, I really want to talk about um, cheap spool loft insulation. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and sort of my why for this. When we moved into this house, there was a layer of fiberglass insulation in our loft that was probably that thick. Really nothing at all. That's what's that sort of 10 centimeters. Um, so, the first thing we did when we moved in here, did it myself. Let's top that up, um, so we have a, a decent amount of fibre insulation. Um, from from what I understand, the sheep's wool insulation goes on top of the fiberglass insulation that that you already have, which presumably was of a of a decent level. Um, so, just what I really want to know is, does that how much of a difference does that make? Is that is there a noticeable difference to adding the sheep's wool on top? Yeah, you, we did exactly the same as you. We had probably about well, it was probably yes, ten centimetres, no more than. Mm. Fiberglass um, that was in the loft already, uh, and I added to that um, another ten centimeters of sheep wool. And the, the sheep wool is uh, they come in these in bats, mm. um, and they're, uh, they're they're cut to the same to the joist standard joist um, difference, uh, and they're about a meter long, so they're easy to handle. And you, you then, of course, you have to cut them to to fit in certain instances. And I, I borrowed, I actually borrowed some sheep shears. <laughs> the only thing I get to cut them because nice. uh, scissors don't work. Yes. Uh, and I, when I was working at, at, at Dan and Chino, um, somebody associated with work kept a flock of sheep. And I said, can I borrow your uh, borrow a pair of shears, please? Mm. Uh, and cutting the sheep's wool, because it's sheep's wool, it worked. Mm. Uh, and it's topping up what's already there. I doubled, in a sense, what was there. And yes, the, the difference was, along with the other messages that we put in, we did cavity wall insulation and, and replaced some of the windows that had to be done. Uh, when you add all those measures together, they, it was almost instantaneous. The difference. Mm. Because a lot of the, the heat from a house, or all, all pretty much the heat from a house, disappears out the walls, the windows, and the roof. Mm -hmm. And of course, heat rises. If, if you cut yeah. it off uh, the journey, it will have to stay in the house. And, and loft insulation is one of those, it's a very quick fix, mm. and it really mm. did work. Our thermostat, which is on the wall, wrong. Get I can side. see it. Yeah. So you can see it next to the house god. And that's set at 17 degrees, uh, no higher, uh, and we don't need it any higher. It works. The house is really comfortable, mm -hmm. really warm. The heating, well, you might have a slightly different problems if you've got chimneys and things like that. We toy it in fireplaces, so heat disappears up those as well. We don't have a chimney. Um, managed to convince my kids that, that Father Christmas got in via other means, <laughs> in, yeah. in, you know, when they believe to exist it. Um, so it's very comfortable and it's not an issue. And in fact, our, our boiler for the heating only comes on for three hours in the morning, half six to half nine. Some days it doesn't come on in the evening at all. Mm, the that's house really good. Yeah. For our house, we, we could, yeah, we have diff we have many problems with this house when it comes to thermal. Um, ah, in fact, let me just really quickly, I'm going to move the camera around. I've got to step away from the mic to do this and I'll show yeah. you some of the sorts of bits of, of problem we have. So just a second. So we have over here one chimney, perfect example of where heat can escape. Obviously, it's a log burner, so it's um, uh, good at sort of as a source of heat. Uh, we have four light bulbs. There's two there. There's two on the other side as well, as yeah. well as a light in the center of the room. And then as far as the windows are concerned, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's not particularly good quality pictures. It's just my webcam. Um, but yeah, you, you get, a, get a feel for it. I'm just going to quickly put this back. So that's that's one room. You've then got you know, all yeah. the other rooms in the house that you have to consider for that. Right. So, right. Know, lights, LEDs. You can get candle LEDs, no problems at all. Yes. Um, and you can get the, the pendant fittings for that. Your log burner will be fitted with, there'll, there'll be some kind of baffle around the, um, there the, is. the, the, the yeah. sort of pipe. 
So that will stop a lot of the heat rising. And so long as you shut the door properly, you won't, it, when it's not on, you won't throw a lot of uh, heat up the, the, the chimney. Right. So Which... it should work to a certain extent. Um, obviously, the, the, the idea behind a burner, wood burner, is that the metal casing is what gets hot, that's your radiator. Yeah. So that's why it works. For the windows, you can get um, triple, double, triple glazed um, sash windows. They you are can. made. And they probably cost an absolute fortune. They do. To, yes. <laughs> You've obviously done the research. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, it, I would always say it, if, it, if it is broken and can't be fixed, then a replacement has to be sourced. That's, yeah. that's the way to look at things. Yes. I would always suggest that. It's a, it's a cradle to cradle approach um, to products rather than cradle to grow. Um, I want to reusing and upcycling, recycling, whatever mm. happens as much as possible if you can do that then do it you can get secondary glazing um, I, we had donkeys years ago my dad did secondary glazing and we had it done and all, all we got was the slight there was a decrease in the noise coming in mm. the going out, but it created a real problem with condensation right that gap, which yep. wasn't it wasn't worked properly in yes. terms of condensation yes. so yeah, it's always something to bear in mind. Right. Indeed, indeed. So we have secondary glazing on some of the windows. This window actually has shutters that are, I don't know, presumably original. So they're actually really effective. Yeah. Um, obviously, it doesn't work so well in the day when you want the light. But, you know, uh, there are things there. Um, you can get, as you say, double, triple glazed uh sash windows and they're really really good actually uh, but we've got the listed buildings problem we have one of them that does is you know does need replacing um so we may consider uh you know planning applications and whatnot but i'm not holding my breath let's say um for that led light bulbs though completely um all of these while there are loads of them they are led um yeah. you know i don't think we have a non-led bulb left in the house so that's that's good. And it's a really easy measure that anyone could just take, um, which is really, really great. And that's that's one of the key messages that a lot of things that people can do can be done very easily mm. and also very cheaply. Yes. Um, yeah. And if we can all do LED light bulbs, for example, and, and draft proofing and all that kind of stuff, that's not expensive. It's easy to do. We can do it ourselves. No mm. Problem at all. Mm. If we can do it, then anybody else can do it. And those savings, work they, they build up. They do, they do, you know. You mentioned your kitchen earlier, replacing, mm. you know, how many uh, uh, bowls was it? It was 13 halogen bowls, which when fitted were 50 watt. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. they broke, I replaced them with 20 watts, and we've now gone down to five. So, so 13 times five rather than 13 times six. That is a massive difference, um, you know, and, and like you say, that stuff adds up. We have exactly that situation, had exactly that situation. We had... Oh, it was a similar number of uh, of 50 watt halogen bulbs in our kitchen and a, and uh, a, f a few in our bathroom and utility room as well all all led and our, we noticed our electric bill actually noticeably visibly reduced um in between fitting them which was surprising because you know um you would think obviously they're not on all the time but we noticed a difference and i would thoroughly recommend them yeah definitely um, you, you mentioned also boilers and heating. Um, so first thing before we talk about condensing boilers is 17 degrees thermostat. Um, having your thermostat set, set to 17 degrees. Uh, do you not find that's a bit cold? No. I'm a northerner. I can cope. <laughs> I have a jumper. I can cope. Is my answer to that <laughs> question <laughs> usually? Wait, it's, that's exactly it. Yes. I, I'm, I'm constantly badgering my. Both my kids are very good. I mean, they're, they're, they are used to cooler houses. My, my wife struggles sometimes, but she puts a place on. And mm -hmm. she often fiddled with the thermostat and said, just leave it alone. It, it, it will even itself out yes, over time. It and yes. 17 degrees is where it's at. And it works. It really does. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had that for years. And I'm, I'm, my kids are now 21 and 17. But when we moved in, I had one and he was two. And mm -hmm. um, so you know, in that time, we've they've got used to having a cooler house. Mm. And like you say, uh, you know, with the jumper and some adjustment, it's fairly, it's completely fine. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. So, yeah. Just a, or a woolly hat or something like that. Oh, I let my hair grow, you know, I keep, keep the heat in. Yeah. COVID's been quite good for that. The barber's been yeah. close. <laughs> I can see it. It's in my eyes. It's irritating. It's a matter yeah. of time, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so boilers then. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's, uh, what sort of measures have you taken there? And, well, we, 
you mentioned condensing boiler. Honestly, I'm not massively knowledgeable uh, on the boiler side of things in terms of uh, condensing boilers work on the, I think the principle that they are more efficient. Yeah. And you get um, the exhaust fumes are compensated. It's basically water that goes out of the, um, the boiler. Uh, and they are, they are hugely uh, more efficient. Um, mm. it, it, but it's a kind of a moot point um, that the boiler that we had fitted was unfortunately rather cheap um, back in 2004. It broke. Um, and the replacement that we got um, had a problem with it because technology moves on with its motherboard. Yes. Um, you're in tech, you know what you know what the problem with the motherboard is. It yeah. goes. Yeah. There's nothing you can do other than buy a new boiler. Unfortunately, I, I hated that. I really mm. did. But the boiler we've got now like, is another. It's another condensing boiler. It's very efficient. Um, we maintain it. The point I want to make on this is maintenance. Yes. Um, if yes. you if you ours is regularly serviced. We have a service once a year. We've now had our boiler in for nearly 10 years. Um, so we had two quick replacements in about six or seven years. The one we've got now is, is 10 years old. It's maintained on a regular basis, serviced on an annual basis. And we had to have it repaired late last year. I thought I had a leak uh, from a radiator somewhere in, into the floor. I, was, I thought it was down here. Mm, mm. uh, it turned out that it was a problem within the boiler um, uh, that was causing the water to, uh, to go out of the waste. Yeah, um, I didn't. It was dripping, but it wasn't dripping so much that you think because I kept having to top it up. Mm, I see. Um, so I would say, and you, you talked about your boiler over twenty years old. Yeah, relic. if it if it's uh, I'm fifty seven, does that make me a relic? <laughs> <laughs> You're not a boiler. <laughs> it's too, well, some people say something like that. <laughs> I've been told similar. <laughs> yes. So it, if if it works and you maintain it, my advice would be because there's embodied carbon in this construction. Mm, mm. Embodied energy is really important. If you can keep it going, keep it going. But mm. at the same time, look at the alternatives. Mm. And I think the alternatives are not necessarily going to be gas fired because at some point we're going to run out of gas. It's yes. the same thing that yes. you know, we've gone through peak oil and all that kind of stuff. We are going to go through peak gas if we haven't already gone through it. Um, I, I don't keep in tune with those things as much as I probably should. But one thing I do know is that any replacement I would look to do, I would look for a, a biomass mm, mm. boiler. Uh, and whilst you're thinking about that, you can do the, the research, you can get combined heat and power um, biomass boilers. They're not much bigger than a standard boiler. And power, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, you can. So mm. it's domestic scale CHP plant, in essence. And I, th I think that is brilliant. Mm, that is great, yeah. So you're, you're creating both heat for um, internal space heating and hot water, but you're creating power through, I, I don't know how it works, but it must be through fans. Mm, so, mm. And, and, and pumps, things like that. Um, so you get um, fairly good, very good quality boilers that, that really do work very well. Mm. So that would be the way to look. Uh, there's there's a lot in what you've just said there. So the first thing I want to pick pick up on is um, not replacing things because it's old for the sake of replacing things. Um, you know, you, you mentioned energy saving appliances as another one. Uh, you know, our, our fridge freezers and all of our white goods get replaced when they stop being fridge freezers and tumble dryers and whatever. Or tumble dryers, that's another one. But I'm not talking about that. We've got yeah, a tumble dryer. Yeah. No, yes. Drive outside. That's what we've done. Well, m most of the time, most of the time we do. Yeah, um, it's yeah. a problem. Yeah, but essentially, yeah. you know, um, because there is embedded carbon in these things, replace them when they die, not not before repair, not rather yeah. than replace. So we're, we're about to do the door seals on the fridge freezer rather than get a new fridge freezer, for example. Um, and the other one is on different forms of of, um, of of generating heat for your house rather than gas. So I've, I'm looking at actively right now um, air source and ground source heat pumps. Um, yeah. And again, us being a, a weird sort of grade two listed um, edge case possibly is going to mean we have some issues here. So so with air source, um, we could possibly do have air source heating, but um, our garden is about probably about the size of this room, so really quite small, and an air source heat pump would take up a good chunk of the garden. So it's not ruled out, uh, but it's 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 a consideration. 
Yeah. Um, but it all does mean that for ground source, because you have to drive deep pylons into the ground, and quite a few of them, ground source is out because we simply don't have enough ground yeah. space. I haven't yet considered biomass. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with our boiler at the moment, so it's not an immediate concern. Um, but I will definitely look into that. I hadn't also realised that they could generate electricity too, which is yeah. really cool as a byproduct. It makes total sense. So that's going to be one I look at. If, if I can physically fit one somewhere, then then that would be great. <laughs> That'd be a really good alternative what you tend to find bruce is that people will put them they'll often be in a garage mm. uh, so attached to the side of the house so that you can have the hopper um, for the, the pellets to be fed through yes um, it all in close proximity uh, our boiler is actually on the first floor of our house um it's on an outside it, it's on the internally but on the outside wall so yes. you know, physically i suppose you could do something with that but probably not a lot of people have a boiler in a kitchen and that's a lot easier to, to deal with in terms of a biomass boiler replacement. I said earlier on about um, if you're having a lot of work done, then it's fine. Do that lot of work at once. Mm. So uh, mm. the, 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 the air, water, ground source, heat pumps, I would suggest if lots of work is being done and lots of space is, is to be had, go for that. Ground air mm. source, mm. whichever one you happen to, uh, to want to use. Ground source, you definitely need a lot of space. You can... Yeah. You can lay the coils horizontally if you've got a 500 yard garden no problems um because you're, you know you, you don't have, you don't have to pile deep you mm. have to go down to the earth's core you just got to go along you know along a, a, a long stretch i've seen that done. Mm. Uh, it mm. just happened to be done by a farmer who had a big field That's, indeed uh, space is required thing. essentially yes, yes. but yes. They, you're thinking about them and that's what people need to do air source is probably one of those that will work um, I saw a, a building, um, it was a new school up in the Chilterns um, last year. Well, it, was, yeah, it was last year, just before we went into the first lockdown. Uh, it was a primary school building that was uh, running on, on an air source heat pump. The air temperature mm. outside was about, I think it was about one degree, yet it was converting this boiler, or the efficiency of the, the pump, was converting that to 20 degrees internally. Mm. Massively mm. efficient. That's really done. great. Yeah. So that definitely is something that, that could be um, considered because they are so efficient. Mm, mm, mm. Definitely, definitely. So, so uh, I'm going to add biomass um, boilers to my research list and continue yeah. in, in uh, looking at uh, air source. Hopefully by the time as our 20 odd year old boiler does go, which uh, hopefully no time soon, um, we'll... we'll uh, will be sort of further along the line technology wise. Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a load more stuff we could discuss. Um, we're starting to get to the the, uh, the realms of running out of time. So I'm going to quickly whip yeah. through a few things that, that we've mentioned uh, and then start to look at sort of wrapping up. Um, so you mentioned water saving devices. So yes. I'm interested to hear what specifically, um, what, you've, what, you, what measures you've taken there. Well, we had um, the, the little plastic bags that you put in the systems and toilets. Hippo. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We've got two toilets. Both of those have, uh, I, I think they both still have hippos. I've not looked in them for years, but they have hippos in them. You know, they stop a certain volume of water being flushed each time. Of course, each of the toilets that we have have both full and half flush measures. Uh, we yep. don't flush every time. You know, the old, if it's yellow, let it mellow, it's brown, flush it down kind of thing. We, we follow that principle. Um, we don't use that much water with those. Um, I think probably the bigger part of our water saving comes from having three water bucks. Mm. Uh, uh, we can, I've got two of the, the allotments. Uh, we, we collect water basically from about 95% of our roof. Uh, mm. our three water bucks, they're completely full at the moment. Um, during the summer, we use them for watering um, the produce that I grow in the front garden at home and anything that's growing rhubarb um, apples in the back garden. Mm. Um, the only time I use the hose to uh, water things is when I top up the, uh, the water butt at the front of the house. Um, I don't hose directly. I fill the water butt and I fill the watering can. You're much more conscious of where you water if you're using a watering can rather than just spraying literally wherever you want. Mm -hmm. Waste a lot less. Um, so three water butts, they, they're all, they're probably 200 and odd litres each. Uh, mm. So we've got about 600 litres worth of water. And we, wherever we can, we try and keep the water to... My, my missus has a hot water bottle at night. She keeps the water in the hot water bottle and that goes into something to be put on plants or what have you. Um, mm. you know. 
makes sense uh we've just we've well, probably last year i think it was last summer when we started uh to to try and grow more food here uh have one installed we probably collect about 50 percent of um, our roof's water and it does all the garden stuff basically without any trouble at all definitely a good measure to take the other thing we've we were trying to do last summer although because we installed the water bar early last summer it wasn't sort of completely full at any point um, was to save waste kitchen water for watering plants with um so when you boil the eggs keep keep the keep the water from that um, when you uh, rinse out the lime scale chunks from the kettle keep the water from that that kind of thing you know um so if you want to get rid of the lime scale in the kettle, if you use lemons, mm. put the cut up lemons into the kettle, fill it, boil it, and leave it overnight. That'll get rid of the lemons. Mm. That's cool. That's cool. I think we've actually done that exact thing one time really recently. <laughs> it did yeah. actually work. It worked <laughs> it better than a chemical solution, which was surprising. Um, but it's just lemon juice. That's yeah, all it is. exactly. There's no no nasties in in it. That and white vinegar. White vinegar is a good um, descaler. Mm mm. Like, mm. Hmm, I haven't tried white vinegar. That one's worth looking at. Brilliant. Yeah, it smells a bit, but it does it does really work. Yeah. Well, I mean the chemical alternative would smell a bit too, so you know Definitely. that's the that's the nature of cleaning stuff, so that's okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well I and I, I do I I've got Nancy Bird's whistle, the great British bake off winner. Her mm. book, Cleaning Green, brilliant. Um, mm. have a look at that. Okay, um, yeah, we'll lots, do. Lots of really good information in there about how to clean things in a more environmentally friendly way. Mm, and that's mm. part of sustainability. You know, that's one of the things I do. It is. And it, it is. We kind of build into everyday life. Mm. No, I would agree with that. So looking to switch, uh, you know, some of the products that you buy. Uh, I, I, I need to be, I need to not go off on a tangent here because we've only got a few minutes left, but essentially, but I, what I, we plan to do a series on it at some point. <laughs> because <laughs> there's loads of stuff there as well um so uh, just before I, I move on from specific measures is there any measure that, that i haven't covered that you particularly want to mention that's um, worth highlighting? You, you briefly touched on it in terms of growing food mm. you try to do that uh, we don't have a huge amount of space at home but i grow stuff in pots uh, in our garden we've got uh, garlic uh, we use our garlic onions uh, beans we've got blueberries in the pots at the front of the house um, and my allotments. Um, mm. well, admittedly, my allotment is five miles away, um, but you know, I, I, I do bike if I can. I don't have to take lots of stuff, uh, and we grow a lot of the food that we eat. Not we're not mm. self-sufficient, but it goes a long way. So we use, we rarely buy onions and garlic, mm. and rarely buy potatoes. And I grow most of those, and they're kind of staple things. More growing at home, more growing in a space, and you can mm. do it in a pot or a container easily. Um, I can't, I, I just don't get why people have, our next door neighbours have got a gravel front garden. Mm. It literally is just gravel, there's nothing else in it. I'm thinking, God, well, perhaps I should ask them if I can go and put a whole load of pots there. Yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> make, make use of that space for, for, yeah. uh, for growing stuff, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned bees earlier, another, no, I need to stop going on tangents. Another, uh, <laughs> <laughs> another another reason why planting stuff is good basically yes absolutely sounds, bees, keeps bees. sounds good um so i'm, I'm going to move on from the specific measures just in the interest of time so um yep. as far as sort of grants are concerned because some of the, the measures that we're talking about here from you know panels and boilers are, are kind of expensive is there any advice you have on kind of grants and seeking to cover the costs for some of these bits and pieces uh, you'll only ever cover part of the costs. We got, uh, for the solar PV, we got less than just less than 50%. Mm. We do get a feed-in tariff, but because we had the grants back in 2004, we get a very low level on our feed-in tariff. We got um, a, about a fifth of the cost of the solar hot water. Mm. Um, they were under clear skies grants. and like that. They no longer exist. They're gone. Well, the, and, and PV was the major PV demonstration project, which mm. wasn't major at all, but it you know, it, it worked for us. Mm. Uh, we got a grant, uh, Snug as a Bug was the, the grant we got towards our cavity wall installation. So all I did literally was research. Now right. there are grants available, but you know, our greenest government ever are not particularly green. Yes. And yes. any granting and any, any, any sort of benefits you might get are decreasing all the time, if not being cut completely. Mm. My advice would be um, always before you're looking to make improvements, Reduce the energy demand you've got. So do the low energy light bulbs, switch off lights when you leave the room, all that kind of stuff. Mm, mm. If you've done all of that, then look at investing in the the, um, the technologies that, that you might be able to get grants for. Research is what it's about, Bruce. Because I've yeah, I, I've not 
I've not researched it recently. Uh, you probably can get grants these days for some of the cost of um, renewable measures that you should do because that's what that's what we need to be moving towards. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, the technology is there. Quick Google search. You know, it's 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 how we find out most things. Indeed, I would agree. Um, I guess the main the main reason I'm bringing it up is just to emphasise uh, that there are grants for some of these these things out there. Um, there are, are unfortunately at the moment at least grants for all of these things. But you know the government have really recently released a bunch of grants for things like panels, which are really worth checking out. That's the main reason I bring it up. Um, yeah. So uh, where to go next? You've talked about what you might uh, what you might be sort of looking at in the future, which is really really cool. Um, so I'm going to ask some of my, my more nuanced questions. So what worries you the most at the moment? That one is going to be one you need to look at your notebook for because it is a more nuanced question. Uh, well, no, no, I do. Well, this, this is, it's close to my heart. Complacency. Um, that, that I think worries me more than anything. It's the lack of engagement. Mm. Um, mm. We are, we're, we are, we're not standing on the edge of the abyss. We're now falling into the abyss. Mm, we are. We are. We, we've gone off the edge. The problem is that there's a whole lot of people who've actually readily driven off the edge of that abyss in their SUVs and their, you know, their gas cells and is not really caring about what, what's going on. They are complacent and mm -hmm. therefore complicit in the problem. I, and I, I think most people, they're aware that something is going on. You know, when we get temperatures like we had in Aylesbury, it was something like 36 degrees one day last summer. That's not an Aylesbury temperature. No, that's not. It isn't. That is, there is something wrong when that happens. Yeah. Um, and, and equally, when we get in, you know, climate change doesn't give us snow in April. I mean, I was down at the allotment the other day and it snowed in April. Mm -hmm. I've had snow in April before. It doesn't happen very often. That's weather. That does mm -hmm. happen. If we start getting snow in April frequently, then there's an issue. Complacency, the lack of engagement, the lack of. There's loads of knowledge out there. There's, some of us are trying to put that across, but people are not listening. So mm -hmm. that is probably what worries me most is the fact that people are not paying attention to what's actually going on. And that's that's the population at large, you know, the 98% of the population that probably doesn't care enough. Mm, should. I would agree with that. And, and, and sort of always add to it that it's, uh, it starts with your own individual actions. Um, I was going to, you know, obviously you can look at government, but ultimately uh, the government will act if individuals care enough about it for them to put the things that you care about in policy, uh, regardless of what government we have in power. Um, so yes. I won't rant on about that, but I agree, essentially. <laughs> um, so the, then the, the flip side of that question then is, is where do you find hope? Young people, some young people. There are some brilliant people out there who, who are who are basically, they're taking this mantle on. They're going to replace the likes of you, me, and David Attenborough in the future. Mm. Uh, they are going to do the works. But uh, and after all, it, it's their planet that we're knackering exactly. by our actions. So yeah. they, we need to be mindful of what they're, they're like. It's interesting. My, my, my two children are, one of them is, is pretty environmentally conscious and aware. The other one is not. It's the younger one I worry about because he is not mm. as environmentally aware as he should be. Perhaps my my sort of um, draconian measures and dictatorial attitude at home have, have pushed them away from it. Now there's a, a message in terms of education. We've got to get that across mm. carefully. I think. So, but young people, there are young people. Greta Thunberg is a, is an absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. example. But there's a Greta in every country, mm -hmm. and, and it's them that we need to listen to. The, the rest of the we don't need to listen to. Them. We know what they're saying. The rest of the population needs to listen. To. Uh, unfortunately, it takes things uh, things like um, massive action um, to, to bring about change. That shouldn't be the case. The, the, the action should be through politicians into into policy to, and law so that we all have to do what we ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. Second. Completely agreed again. <laughs> we have... Again, it's converted. Is it preaching to Indeed, day? indeed. Uh, one of these videos uh, really recently was with a, a circular economy and sustainability consultant. And uh, he echoed everything you just said. So, um, again, yeah. preaching to the converted, but I agree yeah. with you there. We've got the same hymn sheet, obviously. Yeah, it's a good hymn sheet. Same I like it. Yes, yeah, so do I. Yeah. So uh, at Sustainable Aylesbury, we want our town to be a thriving community and a town that thinks about its environmental impact and actually takes action. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what do you like about Aylesbury as it stands uh, I, I used to like its compactness. Um, it's a small, small town. I've lived in big places, Manchester and, and places like that. 
Um, but but its compactness is what I really what I really liked. That that wasn't the reason we actually came to Airport. Mm -hmm. um, my job when we came, I used to live over in Wiltshire, uh, and my job when I came here was based in Princes Risborough. Mm. Uh, I couldn't afford to buy a house in Princes Risborough. Uh, we looked in High Wycombe. I've lived in High Wycombe in the past. I didn't really want to go back there, and there wasn't anywhere that particularly appealed to me. Um, so we tried Aylesbury, uh, and that's why we're here because mm. it's cheaper than Risborough and offers what we want. Um, com its compactness is being affected by all the growth, unfortunately. Um, but I, I do like it as a, a town. It's got pretty much what everything we would need. You know, we don't have to go many places, though. It is well connected, which allows you to get away very easily. Um, mm. That's what you want to do. That's what, um, you can also get back. Um, so it, it was it was compact, but that's being affected. The problem with that is that more houses around the outside leads to more pressure in the town centre. We are not getting mm. within the town centre the additional facilities and services that would go with. Um, a, a huge increase in population, the garden town status and things Indeed. like that don't work properly. Now that's me as an environmentalist and a planner thinking. Right? Mm. The planning has not gone into the town centre. I, I, I agree with you, um, but also it's sort of, to my mind, it's more than the town centre. It, it's sort of like when you build a large housing development, you know, uh, you need to consider infrastructure and sort of services in the places that people live. So not constantly having to go into the town centre, yeah. um, you know, um, but essentially, again, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and most planners these days, will, will you, if you have a large housing estate, you will have a, a local centre within that. Mm. The problem with that, we've got one, it, it, I mean, I'm, the housing estate I live in was built in the mid-1970s. We've got um, a, a very small parade of shops. There's mm. a hairdresser's. Uh, and uh, an Indian takeaway and a news agent that, and a, um, a vet. That's not enough to mm. cater for what people around here would want. They have to go to the town centre right. or pop to Bedgrove, which is not very far away. Um, so we, we, that, that's, there's lack of foresight on, on, on the planners' part to create everything that people need. You've got to create the settlement big enough in terms of new housing space that it generates the needs and the needs, the services, the infrastructure are all put in. Mm. so that people don't have to travel but if they do travel they should be going by foot cycle or some other means that isn't the car yeah. mm -hmm. and cycling given Aylesbury size it's even with all the development that's going on it's still very cyclable you know um it, it is very cyclable but yeah. when it was a cycling town uh, a number of years ago a huge yes. amount of investment went in i i'm a cyclist uh, i don't use the the gem routes because i i think they they're, they're put on footpaths yeah. I personally think cyclists should be in segregated on road space. That's mm -hmm. how cycle networks work. So you don't have to stop at every single junction, mm -hmm. every single road you cross. Uh, to, to, you have to get off or, or look each way. I don't like to do that as a cyclist. I like to start and get to where I want to be without stopping too many times. Yeah. So, yeah. that's something that could be done a lot better I agree, I'm biting my tongue on that one um, I, I'm planning another series on, on cycling in Aylesbury because yeah, um, there's there's things that are good about cycling in Aylesbury and things that lead something to be uh, improved or to desire to be desired and I'm hoping the Garden Town stuff will help with that but is yet to be seen um, yeah. so what is the one thing you think that we as a community could focus on for the greatest local impact? I think it did, literally picks up on what I just said about uh, cycling it, it's more encouragement and proper provision for walking and cycling um i i like i like going walking i like going cycling but from where i am i, I don't i don't get out to the countryside we need green being brought into the town more green and blue mm -hmm. it's more or, or green it's in that so that we have um more of an encouragement for people to use those routes to get out into the countryside the countryside on there is lovely it is it's not been knackered for ages too um, but it's you know, that's another that's another topic entirely. It is. Um, but it, it's there's some really good countryside, but a lot of us can't get out to that readily because we're walking on time. Uh, obviously, greater consideration for that, and for and you mentioned it yourself, proper provision for cycling. Mm -hmm. we had, if we had a really good cycling network that was was designed and built for cyclists and with cyclists in mind, that would work better. But I'm afraid mm. the only way that that's ever going to work is if people drive their cars in this. Yes, it is. Because there isn't more Aylesbury space. at the best of yes. times is good yeah. um, Particularly uh, in the, the morning and, and afternoon peaks. Um, the cars don't move. 
I think there's hope in the area of active travel and sort of cycling in in the country at large and in Aylesbury in the form of the likes of LTM 120 and the gear change document that the government released last year, along with hopefully the garden town stuff more locally, but it's yet to be seen. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's, you know, the right sort of size of town in terms of miles, you could cover it, um, you know, on bike without any real sort of issue, but it does need that infrastructure. Um, So that's... It is generally a walkable and cyclable town. It is. And it's not, you know, there's no real hills around. So, you know, from from the very external extremities into the the town centre is not very far. But a lot of people don't do that. They Mm. don't get in their car. What you need to do is kind of flip that and say, well, here's the alternative use that um, if you're going to use your car you're penalized in some way for doing that mm, mm. They're, they're kind of draconian measures but sometimes that's what you have to to do you know i i, I would mention this as being a bitter pill that needs to be swallowed and so that's, that's sometimes what has to happen and like you say you know what with uh, uh, the how of making this possible there's no solution really but taking space away from cars um to build the infrastructure but anyway i'm going to get off my soapbox uh, we are very much out of time so all that's left to me to say is thank you very much uh, for being up for this conversation today um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and I hope it's been uh, as much of a pleasure for you listening at home as it has been for me to have this conversation. So thank you very much, Colin. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. So uh, what I'll do just to quickly end things is uh, just to put a final slide up on screen or two, just to say where you can find out a bit more information. So if you're interested in in super homes uh, locally in Aylesbury to find out specifically what measures um, people that are looking to make their homes a super home can take, and uh, your house as well is on there, then the link on screen is to to your house um, so people can find out more about uh, the measures they can take and where they find out more about super homes. Um, so all that's really left to do is for me to say thank you very much uh, to you for watching and also again to you Colin for being part of this. Uh, if you like what you've seen today, everything you see is at sustainablealesbury.org.uk which is our website. We have a YouTube channel, all these videos and other bits and bobs are on there along with loads of blog articles. Um, if you're not familiar with Sustainable Aylesbury and this video is kind of your first introduction to us, uh, then welcome, firstly. Uh, and secondly, you know, uh, if, if you like what you hear and, and uh, you know, this is hitting a chord with you, we're looking when we get out of COVID times and we're allowed to, to be out and about in our community to actually take action rather than simply have uh, these sorts of conversations. Um, so if you are listening to this and thinking, yes, that sounds like me, I want to be involved in taking action locally in some of these sorts of issues, there's a form on our website you can fill in to be a part of what we're building here and we really encourage for you to do that um, at the moment we're at the stage where we haven't got sort of a specific list of what we're about um, and that will be shaped by what people in our town are interested in being involved in so um, having your involvement is is really important in that uh, we can be accessed via email we're at hello at sustainable uk. we're on facebook face dot there facebook.com forward slash sustainable Aylesbury and finally on Twitter at sustain underscore Ailes. So that's everything I had to say today. So thank you very much for watching and again thank you Colin for being a part of this uh, of this discussion. So thank you very much. Until next time. Goodbye.